in Red Hat, currently on the DB Zero project, and I'm moving to this role well, from being a shadow of all my QB lead for DB Zero. So we will have a brief look at what chain data capture is, then of course we will focus on the division project, and from there, because we are supposed to focus on non-relational databases, we will talk about uh, chain data capture for MongoDB specifically, and after that we will actually have a look at one of the possible use cases for chain data capture time demo. At the end there will be place for questions and hopefully some answers. So, what it is uh, change data capture? I very much like this uh, definition that change data capture is a process of recognizing changes in a data system and their delivery to some downstream consumers so that these consumers can take actions based on these uh, changes. This diagram actually uh, portrays one of the variations of uh, change data capture is based on mining of the transaction log. Uh, is, is somebody here who doesn't know what a transaction log is? Okay, so just for the remote audience, briefly, a transaction log is sort of a canonical source of truth for each database, and that's the thing which actually records all the operations and all transactions, which then can be used, for example, to recover when something nasty happens to the database, for example, some outage or anything like that. So we have database and we have some users which are actually executing all your regular create, update, delete operations and modifying your data. Then we have a CDC platform which is reading the database's transaction log and it's emitting events about these changes to any uh, possible downstream consumers which can then, for example, store the events as data in some data lake or data warehouse or perform some calculation and uh, statistics on top of that. Uh, besides this transaction log mining approach, there are some alternatives. Mainly, we can uh, implement a CDC based on queries and uh, based on database triggers. However, these approaches uh, do have some disadvantages. Uh, for query-based chain data capture, uh, one of the obvious disadvantages is that you have to constantly execute your queries, so that puts additional strain on your database. And you are also not able to actually capture all the changes because how do you actually write a query which captures deleted data? The answer is you don't, you can't. With uh, triggers, you can actually recognize all the changes to your data, but you get a very database-specific implementation, and you are also limited by the expressiveness of the uh, procedural language which is supported by your, your database. So you might have actually issues getting the changes out of the database. Uh, the most common use cases for change data capture include but are not limited to things like uh, data replication or actually cache invalidation or search and uh, index updates. You can also build uh, auditing on top of it. And uh, last but not least, uh, you can actually use CDC uh, with microservices to implement some of the architectural patterns, uh, which we will have a look at the end of the presentation. One of these things is like reliable data exchange between microservices. Uh, this brings us to the Divisium project. So what is the Divisium? Divisium is actually an open source uh, complex uh, chain data capture platform which covers uh, multiple databases. We have a uh, quite, quite <coughs> active and large community because the project has been around for a while and it's been used in some relatively large scale deployments by our community already. Uh, when I said that we support multiple databases, we have to talk about so-called uh, division connectors, and these connectors can be actually divided into three uh, different groups, so to speak. Uh, first, there are the core connectors. These are the connectors which are, uh, the source of these connectors is actually part of the main division repository under the division organization, and these connectors are developed, maintained, and supported by the core division team. Then we have community connectors, Again, these connectors are housed under the uh, Divisium organization umbrella on GitHub, but uh, they live in separate uh, repositories and they are actually developed by our community contributors. So for this we have DB2, Cassandra, Wittes, uh, and uh, our newest addition with the Cloud Planner. Uh, the third group, which for me is probably the most valuable one, 
are independent connectors. These are connectors built by completely third parties and different companies outside of uh, the Bezium team and uh, Red Hat and everything. Uh, and these are built on top of uh, our common CDC connector framework. So to me, this really showcases that the project kind of took a life on its own and it's now spread beyond uh, the boundaries of our core team and Red Hat in general. So how can you run these connectors? So first and foremost, our database connectors are actually an implementation of Kafka source connectors. So do we have somebody who doesn't have any experience with Kafka? Okay, so Kafka is, um, let's say, event messaging platform, and there is, there's this component called Kafka Connect, which provides the ability to run services or connectors which can get data either into Kafka or out of the Kafka. The ones which are getting uh, data into Kafka are called source connectors. Uh, so, that being a Kafka, uh, Kafka Connect connector, it means that uh, it actually requires Kafka and Kafka Connect to run, and the events are then stored in Kafka topics. So, you can deploy DBZoom as Kafka Connector on top of Kubernetes uh, using uh, the StreamZ operator. Hi, Jakub, you are just in time. Uh, the other option is actually embedding DBZoom into your application through something we call DBZoom Engine. Uh, DBZoom Engine actually started as a tested dependency because we needed means to actually prove that the, connector, uh, the connectors work. But as it's usually with good testing tools, they kind of became used in, in production by some of our community members. So we decided to improve it. And we've actually built another runtime around this DBZoom Engine and that's how DBZoom Server was born. Uh, DBZoom Server pretty much fulfills the same role as uh, Kafka Connect does, but it's simpler, more lightweight uh, runtime, and it's really meant for different architect uh, data sync architectures where you either don't want to or can't use Apache Kafka. Uh, we also support uh, many other things besides actually being able to store these events in Kafka. You can get them into Amazon Kinesis, Google Pasta, or uh, simply send them over, over HTTP. Uh, the new addition to this ecosystem is the DBZoom operator, which was just released in the first preview version, and you can actually use that to uh, deploy easily DBZoom server on top of Kubernetes as well. Uh, now, to the third uh, important part of this uh, talk, well, we also need to say what the MongoDB is, because that's going to be the database of focus for today. Uh, MongoDB is a document-oriented NoSQL database. Uh, NoSQL database that means that it doesn't deal with relations. Uh, similarly, as for example, MySQL would. And document, it means that the data is actually changed in, uh, stored in form of documents. Uh, other than that, uh, there's a pretty similar structure to, to the database. So you have the database itself. A collection would be an alternative to what the table is in the relational databases and the document would be a uh, counterpart to a row in, in that table. Uh, the document itself are uh, stored in a format for BSON, which is a binary representation of JSON. However, it's not just binary JSON. BSON goes beyond uh, what a regular JSON is. For example, there are additional data types which are supported in BSON that you wouldn't find in JSON. And, uh, MongoDB also has uh, native support for change of the data observation. Uh, before we actually get to extracting the data, we need to talk about how the database can be run. First and foremost, there is this standalone deployment, but that's not really meant for production. It's uh, recommended just for testing and development environments. And since there isn't any way to actually extract the data changes from uh, standalone deployments, we don't care about it and we cannot possibly cover it. So that leaves us with two, a replica set, which is the basic unit of uh, MongoDB deployment. It provides some uh, basic data redundancy and HA features. And then if you want to achieve horizontal scaling of your data, you can use uh, MongoDB sharded cluster deployments. The primary one is a replica set, as I already said. And it's a typical primary secondary topology where you can actually see that we have a client and 
first of all, all the writes are always uh, directed to uh, to primary, which holds the data, and the data is replicated to secondaries, which acts first as a beta replicas, and second, they can actually uh, take of the some of the load from primary to support reads from from the secondaries. So uh, that's the basic topology. Uh, if uh, primary goes down, then the secondaries are actually entering an um, election phase, and they will amongst themselves elect a new primary. This is done by the fact that there is a heartbeat going on between all the replica set nodes, which means that every node in a replica set is actually aware of the existence of all, all the others. Uh, the data replication part is actually uh, the core of uh, what we need uh, to know for the As you can see here, we can see some uh, data copying going on, and this is so-called uh, operations log. At the beginning, I've talked about uh, databases having this transaction log, and th uh, this is actually an equivalent in MongoDB for this. So what is an operation log, or OBOC for short, in MongoDB? It's a cut collection holding a rolling record of data modifications. What does that mean? Well, first, as I said, what a collection is, is an equivalent to what a table would be in a relational database. And what it means that it's a capped collection, so it means that there are some restrictions on, it, uh, on top of it. And Oblock specifically can be restricted in two ways. First, uh, there is a maximum configurable size of all the data within the Oblock. And there is also a time a configurable time retention in hours. Uh, if uh, the Oblock either grows very large outside of the maximum size, or a record is in Oblock for longer than is the maximum retention time, then entries will start dropping out of the oblock, and these are actually mean that the data will be lost. So, uh, long story short, oblock actually keeps all the changes done to the database for a specific uh, period on, of time. So, depending on the configuration, the size, and the retention of oblock, that's how far back in time you can actually go to uh, replicate all the changes which were done through primary. And this oblock is actually the means how data replication is achieved in uh, 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 replicas of deployment for MongoDB. So if this replica, this the secondary two replica went down and the primary had an oblock which is configured to retain data for two hours, uh, for example, then as long as the secondary would uh, be back up uh, in less than two hours, it could just really stream all the required changes. If the secondary was done for longer than two hours, that it would have to discard all its data and actually copy everything uh, from the from the beginning. Uh, for sharded clusters, it's where it starts getting complicated. We have to first add a component called Mongo's, which is the Mongo router which decides to what shard you want to go, and then we have separate uh, shards. But first, what, what actually shard, uh, sharding achieves is a means to uh, horizontally scale your data. So it means that if you have, uh, uh, for example, a customer collection or order collections, then a portion of the data is actually distributed to each of your shards. And the Mongo router is the only part which actually me, uh, knows about all the specific shards. So that's sort of the glue layer on top of regular replica sets, which decides where uh, should queries be routed, or how to match search results, or perform sorting across these shards. Because the shards themselves are individual replica set, uh, sets with individual operation logs. So they are not the variable of each other's existence compared to the nodes inside of replica set. Uh, getting the changes out, out of this oblock uh, can be tricky sometimes. So since version 4, MongoDB actually provides an abstraction uh, called change streams. Uh, this is a feature where you can actually uh, subscribe or open a change stream in the database, and the database itself will push information about uh, these changes in form of change stream documents to the to the client, and this is the feature which uh, DBZoom actually employs to extract uh, these changes from MongoDB. Uh, you can actually start uh, the change stream at some operational time, which again can go as far back as is the maximum retention of the oblock, because change streams are still just an abstraction on top of oblock, 
or when you actually get some change stream document from this uh, from this change stream, you can use its ID uh, as the resume token to uh, start receiving these changes after a certain operation uh, from the from the past. Uh, how does the entire uh, change extraction process uh, function with uh, uh, with Divisium? Well, first in Divisium we have these two uh, phases. First the phase is something we call snapshot. That is what uh, at the beginning we actually query and uh, transfer all your data into events to actually get the starting point. Before we do that, the first thing we do is we actually obtain a resume token. So this is the point of time where we started the <coughs> connectors and from there we will actually stream all the changes. But, per, but before we start streaming, we transfer all the currently per persisted data into, into events. Once this initial data copy phase is performed, then we switch into what we call a streaming phase. And that's where we use this formally obtained uh, resume token and start open a change stream and start streaming the, stream, streaming the data. With each change document we receive from uh, the open change stream, we do two things. First, we actually transform it into event and we deliver it into the sync, which could be Kafka, which could be Kafka Redis, HTTP, Google Pops Up, or any other messaging system we support. And we also store uh, the resume token for this particular change into our offset storage so that in case there is an outage, for example, there is a collection loss to the, uh, loss to the database, we can resume streaming from that point of time. Once again, I've mentioned change streams being an uh, abstraction on top of uh, operational logs, so that means this offset can be at most as old as is the maximum retention time for change streams. In case you actually, for example, have an outlook which retains the uh, changes for two hours and your connector is down for more than two hours, then when you restart the connector, depending on configuration, the entire process will happen from the beginning and you will again have to undergo the initial uh, copy of the data because otherwise you would be risking data and this is something we cannot guarantee. Or we cannot guarantee, don't want to, we, should, can, we want to guarantee the exact opposite that you don't lose events. Uh, it's a bit more complicated when we get to then we get to uh, sharding because in this case we have two options how to actually extract the data. In both cases we are opening change streams, but in the so-called replica set uh, collection mode, what we do is actually in order to achieve higher throughput and higher performance, we open an indi individual connection to each of the shards uh, within the sharded cluster. This has the advantage of having larger throughput because we stream changes down to each of these charts separately. But it also means that we can never actually guarantee, for example, the or order of changes performed across these charts. We guarantee it always if there is a, for example, if there is a new if there is a new entry which we are observing, we can guarantee that it will be that all the changes will be in the right order for one specific entry, one specific document. <laughs> So we will always get creation first, then, the, then there will be modifications in the right order, and if you delete it, it will be always at the end. Is there a question in the, in the background? Or? Okay, so we, we can guarantee the order of these changes for one particular document, but we cannot guarantee the order across documents because there is no means of actually knowing for the reason whether a change in chart 2 occurred before or, or after a change in the chart 1. We can have these guarantees in the other uh, connection mode for sharded cluster, which is called sharded. Uh, in this case, we open the chain streams against the Mongo uh, against the Mongo router, which glues everything together. Because the Mongo router, in uh, in turn, opens chain streams to each of the shards, and it performs a synchronization and orders everything as it as it should be. But the price for it is that there is some overhead and then there is some delay before you actually can get these changes from uh, all of those shards. So this is all a theory, but let's us look at how we could actually approach uh, some practical problems using Divisium and MongoDB. So 
Imagine we have a simple order service which needs to do two things. First, we need to uh, store an order and we also need to send a message to another service called shipment service. And we need to do all of that reliably. What's the problem? Well, uh, dual writes are prone to inconsistencies. So if you want to guarantee that we do both of these things, what's the first uh, solution which comes to your mind? Any ideas? Well, at the same the, time. What? At the same time. Yeah. Well, not at the, not, not at the same time, but uh, sort of both or none. Yeah. You can you have to guarantee that both succeed. Well, distributed transaction and two-phase commit would be an option, but first of all, you may not want to use distributed transaction. And for example, if the system where you want to send the message is, for example, Apache Kafka, it may not even support it. So. How do you actually ensure that if you store the data in the database, then the message is always delivered as well? Uh, the solution is something called a Hubbox pattern, and it starts with actually eliminating one of these external systems. And since the database belongs to the service, the one system we eliminate from this storage process is sending the message or eliminate, we move it somewhere else. So instead of initially uh, sending a message, we save a message into an outbox collection together with the original order, and we do both of these uh, inserts uh, in a single document transaction. That means that we eliminate the service coupling, but then again, we still haven't sent the, sent, sent the message to the Apache Kafka, so we need to introduce sort of a work worker process which will be responsible for delivering of these messages. The way it will look like is that we will have this order service that stores both the order and the message and then we need some thingy which will read these messages and guarantee that they get delivered into Apache Kafka. So what's the process for the worker thingy to actually send the message first? It needs to form the collection and check if there are any unprocessed messages. So it gets a message, then it needs to send the message, and then it needs to mark this specific message in this outbox collection as processed. Uh, what are the weaknesses of such approach? Links. Yes. You cannot guarantee you cannot guarantee that you actually do this near real time. And then you again are pulling the pulling the collection, so you have a similar problem as you would have with the with the query based uh, change data capture approach, and you can't really solve the fact that uh, in order to reliably mark it as uh, mark it as processed, you would have to again do both of these in in, in transaction the sending of the mes uh, message and marking that process. This is something which cannot be solved, so the best you can do is actually have at least one guarantee. We can guarantee that each message will be processed, but we can guarantee that it will be processed more than once. And uh, last, by, by no means least, if you are uh, the developer who is supposed to implement this pattern, then it requires a boilerplate. You've gotten from uh, sending a message to implementing an entire worker process which has to clear a database sent message and ensure that it does it reliably. That seems like a lot of work. However, this is actually where DBZoom can help you because it gets rid of the entire need to implement this worker process uh, resp responsible for delivering these messages. You just plug uh, DBZoom to your database and it will completely act as, as, the, as the worker process it will be observing any changes by opening the check streams to this outbox table and it will be emitting these messages to a desired Kafka, Kafka topic. There are, several, there are several mandatory but configurable parts which these messages need to get ahead. So we need something called an aggregate type. This is just purely to distinguish different message types. Then we need some ID of the related object to, to this message and then you need to provide some payload which is any data or none data which you, need to, which you wish to send with this message. Then there are additional fields which 
uh, you can add as you, as you wish. For example, in this case, uh, I have a field called type, which distinguishes the type of the event. Uh, let's demonstrate with a simple, simple demo. Simple demo. So, first of all, I have a local Kubernetes cluster running where I have a few things. First, I have a Kafka deployed uh, well, through the Stringzy operator. I have some tooling image which provides us provide, well, provide with things like Kafka can to actually have a look inside the Kafka topics. And I have a Mongo database, uh, Mongo database uh, running. And I also have a database operator. First thing I'm going to actually do is uh, deploy uh, deploy the museum, and before that happens, we can actually have a look at what is the configuration. So, this is the configuration for the museum, and we can see three important parts. First, we have this same con configuration portion, which says that we will be actually sending these events to Apache Kafka. If we wanted to, we could replace this Kafka configuration with, for example, Google pops up and the messages will be emitted to Google Pops up. Then we have this source configuration, which just unsurprisingly configures a MongoDB connector because we want to extract these changes from MongoDB. And the most important part for us is actually this transform part because the outbox pattern support is implemented as data transformation. And it's again really simple. It just says that we want to use this Mongo event router. Uh, this is a configuration to which topic we want to actually uh, send these uh, send these messages. So in our case, it will be events dot and then a name which we will configure as the aggregate type. Then this additional configuration just uh, says where the type field should be placed, and that we kind of want to unwrap uh, our data. Uh, our, our data to actually get rid of some Digizium format envelope which we are using for other uh, messages. So in the meantime, it looks like Digizium actually started. So uh, first we will actually uh, simulate what a service would do with the, with the data. So we will open uh, Mongo shell connection, and we will just demonstrate that uh, there is no outbox collection yet. It is not there. Uh, okay, there are a couple of O's, but it's not, not there. Okay. Uh, and I have a simple JavaScript code which will do a simple simulation. First of all, we will open a MongoDB session. And then in the transaction, we will create a new order, and we will also create a message which will just contain this order as its payload, and we will store both these in transaction. So now we store it, start it, and we can have a look to. into Kafka and see whether we've actually received these messages. I will just connect to Kafka. I want uh, this mode. I want it unbuffered. Uh, and I want a topic. I want it to go from the beginning. And I want a topic name uh, events order. And just to have it look nice, we will pipe it to yeah. And so we can see that we've received this this match message, which in this case we are able to show just the payload. But if we looked at the entire Kafka message, including the uh, message envelope, that then we would get a slightly different output. And in this case, you can see that in headers we also have this order created value for the for the type uh, for the type field. If we were to cancel the same order, again I will cheat a bit and copy it from here.
then you can see that we've actually received another another message. And in this case, the payload is empty because uh, we haven't uh, stored anything. In this case, we are just canceling the order. So the takeaways from this is that CDC is a quite useful tool uh, in event-driven architectures. Debezium is actually a project that provides the mean to employ chain data capture, and Atmos pattern provides efficient means for microservices uh, to actually reliably exchange data and is an alternative to uh, distributed translations and two-phase comments. If you have some questions, I will try to answer them. It's still, at least one still legal, right? Yes. Yeah. Anything else? Although, spe although specifically with uh, with Kafka, and that's something Voita here would know more about, there is now a possibility to have exactly once, right? Yeah. But that's specific for, for Kafka at this moment, because Kafka is the one doing the, the, the duplication. Okay, if there are no more questions, I thank you for your attention.